Today we are going to be talking about the history and culture of Oman. Um, the Oman being the country that we are traveling around right now. We actually were in Oman in, uh, when we were in Kassab on Saturday. This afternoon we will be talking about unity and diversity in the Middle East and then tomorrow we are in Salala, Oman. And that's the reason we're doing this talk right now is to prepare you for that. Um, and I think you'll have a wonderful time. My wife and I were both very impressed with Salala when we visited it previously, and I think you'll really enjoy that. Later on, after Salala, we'll, we'll talk about the children of Abraham, the Abrahamic religions, uh, Moses, the Israelites, and crossing the Red Sea, and introduction to Islam, which a number of you have told me you're looking forward to that or anxious to learn more about the faith that is dominant in this region. And then we will talk about Alone in the Desert, Christian monasticism, that in preparation for our visit to St. Catharines. But right now, we want to talk about the country of Oman. Oman has a fascinating history. Um, this map I showed to you before. We, of course, started out up here in Dubai, which is, this is the United Arab Emirates. In Dubai, on Saturday, we stopped here at Kassab. And it's rather unusual. This is the country of Oman, but in addition to this area, there are two non-contiguous, meaning not connected to the rest of Oman, areas that belong to the country of Oman where we were, the Masandam Peninsula, which is where Kassab was, and then there's a tiny little area right here that is also part of Oman. They are inside the United Arab Emirates. I actually have not been able to find out how all that happened, but that's really not that unusual. In fact, uh, for any of you who live in the northwest of the United States, there's an area called Point Roberts that is entirely surrounded by, uh, it's right on the coast, but it's surrounded by Canada, but it's part of the United States. So to get there from the continental United States, you have to travel through Canada. Similar thing here. For anybody from Oman to get to either of these territories that they own, they have to go through the United Arab Emirates. Um, so this country, which is in the uh, southeastern corner of the Arabian Peninsula, this is the symbol of Oman. It is crossed swords with a Kandar dagger, which the Kandar dagger I'll show you some pictures of as well. You will see those in your travels because they are a common, men often wear them, especially in ceremonial things, but many men, especially older men, will wear them all the time. And this uh, symbol of Oman is on their flag. So the uh, green, red, and white bars, and then the symbol of Oman in the corner. That's the Omani flag. I say that Oman has an interesting history because there was a period of time between the, the late 17th century and the mid-19th century in which Oman was a major empire. They not only uh, controlled this area in southeastern Arabian Peninsula, but they controlled uh, parts of Iran, they controlled parts of, of Pakistan, and in fact, almost all of northeastern Africa, the coastal cities, all the coastal areas for sure, uh, what we know of as Kenya and Tanzania, the capital city of Oman for a long time was on the island of Zanzibar. Zanzibar is actually a collection of islands off the coast of, of Tanzania, modern day Tanzania. And they controlled all of that. I'll tell you a little bit more about that as we go along. But this is a country with a very, very rich history, and especially the last 45 years have been interesting, and we'll talk about that as we get into it. Uh, this is, this gives you a perspective in terms of the location, this is the Arabian Peninsula, Saudi Arabia covering most of that, with Oman here, this is the United Arab Emirates, Yemen, and then when you get further up, you get Jordan, uh, Syria, Iraq, Iran, etc. So obviously from here, this is the route that we're taking up and through the Suez Canal and then up to Athens. But this is the location of the country we're sailing past and they will be, we will be visiting tomorrow, the country of Oman. I showed you this image as well, but uh, give you a little bit more information about it. The Sultanate of Oman, prior to 1970, this country was called Muscat and Oman. That was the name. And the reason it had a dual name, Muscat and Oman, is because at that, up until the 70s and the current sultan, there were two very distinct cultures in this, this country. The coastal culture, which was controlled, completely controlled by the sultan and was more sort of modern and cosmopolitan. And then the interior, so there's Muscat was the re referring to the part that the sultan had absolute control over and was more progressive, more modern. But interior of the country, which is the, the Oman reference of Muscat and Oman, 
It was much more traditional, much more tribal in its uh, origin and its orientation. And even though the Sultan technically was the ruler, it actually was primarily controlled by an imam, the religious leader of the country. And up until the 1970s, there was always conflict between the Sultan and the coastal areas and the imam and the interior areas. There were feuds going on and people being driven out of the country and, and all sorts of difficulties that occurred. Um, and all of that got straightened out in the 1970s and it's a very dramatic story. But let's back up a little. In terms of ancient history, recent archeological evidence has demonstrated that, and they found this in the, the like 2011, 2012, most of the discoveries, that there are areas in Oman, especially the Dofar region, which is the region we're going to be in uh, when we're in Salalah, in the Dofar region, they have found evidence of Nubian culture. Nubian is it's the first time they ever found this outside of Africa. This is over 100,000 years old, and they have discovered uh, stone, uh, stone working implements and various other aspects that prove that there were people who left Africa and crossed over to the Arabian Peninsula. What happened is between 90,000 and 130,000 years ago, there were huge mega droughts in Africa. Africa is widely agreed to have been the, the birthplace of humanity. That's where human beings as we know them came from. But between 90 and 130,000 years ago, they had mega droughts in the continent of Africa. In fact, the Sahara is a product of that. There are parts of the Sahara region, and by the way, I don't say Sahara Desert, because Sahara means desert. So if you say Sahara Desert, you're saying desert, desert. Uh, and unless you're talking about the big nightclub complex in Las, Ve in Las Vegas, you say Sahara, people know what you're talking about. So the Sahara was caused by some of these mega droughts. And when the mega droughts started happening, the people who lived then, 130,000 years ago, ended up having to travel to the coasts or trying to get away from the droughts. Many of them traveled north, and at that time, the Red Sea was much lower than it is. In fact, they believe there was a period of time at the end of the last ice age when it's possible that it was only about two and a half to four kilometers between Africa, that would be like the Somalia, Eritrea kind of area, the narrowest place where the Red Sea's mouth is, we're going to be passing through that later. It was only about two and a half to four kilometers, and it was very shallow. In fact, they believed there was a time when you could have actually waded across that area from Africa to the Arabian Peninsula. And they believe that people crossed over there. They have found indications of Paleolith Paleolithic or uh, Stone Age uh, communities. They have found tools, some of which they believe are as old as 125,000 years. All of this in Oman. The indication is they crossed at the narrowest place, at the mouth of the Red Sea, which means that they would have entered into Yemen, and as they could, what we know as Yemen, and they continued up into this area in Oman. Now, much of the Arabian Peninsula at that time was not the sort of horrifically hot and dry desert that it is now. It, at, at one point, was much more lush, much more forested area. If you, when you get off the boat tomorrow at Salala, if you, particularly if you take the serene Salala trip, I think the archaeological one probably goes out of the city. But you'll be going through some very lush garden areas where they grow a lot of uh, produce. There actually still is an area along certain parts of the coast of Oman that are quite lush. And then you get into a mountain region. I'll show you some pictures. And what happens, like in so many areas, I, we used to live in Seattle, and Seattle is so wet because all of the winds come in off the, off the water and carry the moisture, they hit the mountains and they drop all their water. The same thing happened and still happens to a great extent in Oman. Winds from the Indian Ocean come in, they carry moisture in, they hit the mountains which are toward the back of, uh, of Oman and they drop their moisture. So there are some parts of Oman that are among the most lush in the whole Arabian Peninsula. And you'll see some of that tomorrow if you go particularly on the Serene Salala visit. So very, very early on, Oman has evidence of some of the earliest humans who left Africa settling in this area. And they are doing more and more archeological research. This is one of those sites. They actually have found structures that they believe are as much as 100,000 years old. Where where uh, stones were simply piled up to provide some sort of cover. 
a lot of this has just been discovered, it's just being uncovered. One of the most important aspects of modern um, Oman was the advent of the Islamic faith under Muhammad in the 7th century. Oman is very proud of the fact that they were some of the earliest converts to Islam. In fact, during Muhammad's life, there were people who carried the message of Islam to Oman, and it was well received. And they became uh, Muslims before a lot of the other people in the rest of the, the Arabian Peninsula, and then before it spread out from there. But there is an important difference here. I've already mentioned several times, and we'll talk about this later, that the two largest bodies of Islam are Sunni, which is about 85% of Islam, and Shia. But Oman is neither one, at least the predominance is neither one. They are a third group of Muslims called Ibadi. And in fact, the Ibadi movement within Islam, or the Ibadi denomination, if you want to think of it that way, within Islam, began before the division of Sunni and Shia. It's very early on, after the, the Islam came here during the lifetime of Muhammad, but after Muhammad's death, within 20 years, as other caliphs or successors to Muhammad came along, there was a movement of a, a group of people who did not approve of the third and fourth caliphs after Muhammad. And they, uh, in fact, one group of them, the Karahites, ended up uh, assassinating one of the, actually two, of the, uh, the caliphs that came after Muhammad. The, Ibadis, this movement, did not approve of those uh, caliphs, but they did not believe in violence. In fact, the Ibadi version of Islam has always been known for moderations. They are personally, those who follow the Ibadi discipline in Islam, are personally very disciplined and very conservative. It is a very conservative uh, interpretation of Islam. But the difference is, while they take it very conservatively themselves, they do not try to force other people to that. They are known for toleration. And particularly, Christians and Jews, practicing Christians and Jews, have always been very well respected and very much tolerated in, in any of the Ibadi centers of Islam. Now, Oman is by far the largest. It's the only country where the Ibadi denomination, again, if you want to call it that, within Islam, is the dominant one. But it also exists in Tunisia, in Libya, in Northeast Africa, Zanzibar especially, because of course that was controlled by uh, Oman at one point. So they are very, very conservative personally, but very moderate and very tolerant to other beliefs. They, it's sort of like the Ibadi has always said, that we have a very high expectation for what Islam should be, but we're also sensible enough to know you can't force that on people. And so um, they get along well with both other members, for the most part, other members of Islam. Although the Ibadi uh, movement in Islam is still a mystery to most. The Ibadi scholars always say, we read all of the works of the Sunni uh, learned men and of the Shia learned men, but none of them ever read our stuff. And so they, know, they feel they know more about the other aspects of Islam than the other aspects of Islam or anybody else know about them. But it's a fascinating kind of uh, uh, section of Islam. Well, it Islam came to Oman very early, again during the life of Muhammad, by, by the 750s, so this is, we're talking a hundred years, um, a little more than a hundred years after Muhammad, they actually established an imamate, which means they had their own national religious Islamic leader, who was a body, in uh, Oman, and that was great, except it ended up that the political authority, particularly the Sultan, and the Imams over the centuries since then have typically not always gotten along. Um, there was a period of time in which there was a great deal of uh, influence from other nations, Portugal and other places, and the all of those other forces, the Portuguese and the Iranians, they were also here, they got thrown out by um, the Imam at one point, and they made him the Sultan. So he was both the religious leader and the political leader, and that was great. And he started the dynasty, this is in the uh, 1700s, he started the dynasty that continues today in terms of the current Sultan. It has continued since the mid-1700s down until today. But the problem was, like so many families, you know, dynasties, it's a, a hereditary thing, uh, the other parts of the family didn't agree with the subsequent sultans, and so there was a split. One branch of the family, for the most part, became the imams, the religious leaders, 
and another branch of the family became primarily the sultans, and they ended up with long battles to the point where they literally had armies fighting each other here in, uh, in Oman. One of the things that Oman has been particularly known for is this, and you'll probably see a lot of it, especially if you're on the Serene Salala tour. This is frankincense. It is, um, has been very, very popular down through the centuries. It is used as incense in religious services. People would use it, burn it in their home. Um, it's been used to make, it still is used to make perfumes. The oil from this is used as perfume. Uh, they use it for medicinal purposes. In fact, they'll, they chew it and they say it settles your stomach. It's good for you in that regard. Um, it is the rosin of a tree, or resin of a tree. This is actually a Boswellia sacra is the name of the tree. It is the frankincense tree. And what they do, if you can tell down here, they will cut the tree and then the, the, the resin will seep to the surface. And when it's exposed to air, it hardens. Not hard hard, but it gets firm. Um, they say that the whiter it is, the purer or better it is. And it's dependent upon what time of year they harvest it as to what the quality is. And so you will see some of it that's very white, some of it that's gold, and some of it's even very dark brown. They, they say, I don't, I'm not an expert on that, but they say that the lighter color, the more white it is, the purer it is, the more better quality it's supposed to be. But frankincense was so important, especially early on in Oman, that um, it was the, a major export. Today, most of the frankincense that's produced in Oman is used in Oman. And Somalia, who also has these Boswellia sacred trees, um, Somalia, even though Somalia is not very well organized as a country, they are the biggest exporter of frankincense now. This has always been highly valued around the world. If you know the, the story of the birth of Jesus, the Magi who came from the East, they brought three, three gifts. You remember what they were? Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Myrrh is a different kind of tree resin that is hardened, and you can buy myrrh here as well. You can purchase this stuff, and it's not that expensive. You can even buy the little charcoal burners in case you want to burn it for incense in your home. But frankincense and myrrh, two different tree resins, were at one point worth their weight in gold, quite literally. They were equal to gold in value based upon weight. It's not that expensive anymore, so you can take some home with you if you want. In fact, it makes great Christmas presents. You know, if you've got friends or neighbors you want to take something they're not likely to see somewhere else, you can take some frankincense back to them. But it has always been terrifically valued, and Oman has always been very famous for their frankincense, especially from the Dofar region. Now, as I mentioned, there have been a number of different peoples, uh, that is, nations, that have uh, attacked, conquered, been involved with Oman over the centuries. The first Europeans to come here were the Portuguese. The Portuguese, of course, were great travelers. They settled a lot of different areas. And throughout Oman, you will, they have some spectacular fortified cities. They have forts, castles like these. Um, you can see this is along the coast. Um, this is Nakal Fort. Um, and so you'll see these in quite a few places. The Portuguese built some of them, and some of them were built to fight off the Portuguese. Because in addition to the Portuguese, the Dutch were involved in this area because the Dutch were great explorers and travelers as well. Uh, the British have always been involved in this part of the world, and the Iranians, as I mentioned earlier, also were here. But in the mid-1700s, uh, the Portuguese were thrown out in the late 1600s, in the mid-1700s, the Iranians and others were thrown out of the country. And at that point, in the mid-1700s, the man who was responsible for getting rid of them, a man named Ahmed Ibn Said al-Said, the founder of the Said dynasty, and the current sultan's name is Kabus bin Said al-Said. Sound familiar, right? That's been um, 350 years later, that, uh, 260 years later, sorry, my math's not very good, um, that this family dynasty has continued on until today. So you will see these kinds of forts all along the coastline, especially because Oman has always been a maritime power. At one point, they were the most, most significant maritime, that is, seagoing power in all of the Indian Ocean. They were one of the most famous shipbuilders in all of this part of the world. Uh, the, those of you who went on the Dow cruise yesterday, the Dow, those of you who weren't on that boat, I'll show you a picture. The Dow, which is a particular design of boat that Oman uh, invented, they're very seaworthy, they're very stable. 
and they they were famous for building ships, not just their own ships, but they did, built ships for all sorts of other different countries and empires. I mentioned to you Zanzibar. This is the Emperor's Palace on Zanzibar, the island of Zanzibar. At one point, that was Oman's capital. Now, this is all the way down the coast uh, off Tanzania, modern-day Tanzania, and yet Zanzibar and the islands around that, they're all called Zanzibar, but there's a main island, Zanzibar. They were called the Spice Island because they had cinnamon and cloves and all sorts of other things. If you've ever heard a reference to the Spice Islands, that's it. And Oman controlled that for many, many years. In fact, they technically continued to control Zanzibar until the 1960s. Zanzibar, even though the, the Omanians had left, Zanzibar continued to pay tribute to the government of Oman until 1964. Now, while they were in Zanzibar, while they controlled the eastern coast, the northeastern coast of Africa, and had properties in Iran and Iraq, their greatest period of, uh, of power was in the early 1800s, the early 19th century. But the primary reason why they controlled these areas in northeastern Africa was because they promoted the slave trade. Oman was very much involved in slavery. And they got very wealthy doing that because there were a lot of countries who were buying slaves. All the Americans can raise their hand at this point. From countries that were taking slaves from Africa. And the problem was for the Omanis, at least, although a great thing for getting rid of the slave trade, in the mid-1800s, uh, Great Britain outlawed the slave trade. And in the process of doing so, they got pretty aggressive in wanting to stop other countries, especially countries they had influence over, like Oman, they were very close to Oman, convincing them to stop doing this terrible thing. Well, in the mid-1800s, the end of the British involvement in the slave trade was such an economic uh, depressant to Oman, they had a massive economic collapse in the mid-1800s. In fact, to give you an example, from 1850 to 1870, the population of Muscat, the capital of Oman, at least the, the uh, mainland capital, went from 55,000 people in the city to 8,000. Mm -hmm. It was a massive economic collapse for them. And they did not recover from that for over 100 years, not until the 1970s, which is part of the great story. So during that period of time, from the mid-1800s to the mid-late uh, 1900s, um, Oman became this isolated and quite poor country. In fact, they remained uh, kind of a medieval culture during much of that time. It's almost as though they went backward in time. In, uh, up until 1970, the Sultan had personal slaves. He maintained slaves in his palace until 1970. Um, and it was... That's part of what we're going to talk about in terms of the astonishing change in that country since that time. Culturally, um, Oman shares a lot of cultural similarities to other countries. It's in, in the Middle East, it's Arabian neighbors, but in many ways it's also unique because Oman, more so than almost any other country in the Middle East, was involved in other parts of the Indian Ocean and in Africa, etc. They ended up with kind of a melding of a lot of different kind of influences, and in many ways, it's very difficult to nail down one distinctive uh, aspect of culture that you can say is Omani. They have a blend of all kinds of things, some of it Arabic, some of it African. Um, it's a fascinating kind of blend of things. Um, beautiful picture. These two images sort of give you an idea about the traditional dress. The man on the left-hand side is wearing the white floor-length cotton garment, which is called a dishdashi. The dishdashi you will see everywhere. In fact, in Oman, it is the required dress of anyone who's involved in government service. They have to wear this. And it's comfortable, it's cool, it's easy. I mean, you don't have a lot of trouble figuring out what you're going to wear today. Um, and so you will see a lot of people wearing this, as you may have seen similarly in Dubai, for instance. This clothing is common throughout much of the Middle East, but especially in this sort of uh, Persian Gulf and surrounding area. One of the things about this, you will notice uh, here, there is a braid on this dishdashi. How many of you were on the Dow uh, cruise two days ago? Did you notice that the pilot, the captain who was driving the boat, he was wearing a dishdashi. Did you notice that he had a braid that hangs out on one side? This is called a furaka. The furaka is a braided piece of cloth. This is pretty much unique, at least the Omanis invented it, and you see it on all Omani dishdashas. Um, I've seen other dishdashes in other countries where they don't have it. That is intended to be soaked in perfume. 
And much like they used to have nose gaze in Europe, you know, these little things that when there was a bad smell, you could hold it up. They do the same thing. I have seen Omani men, when we were in Oman earlier, take these and hold them up to their nose. When there's an unpleasant smell, they hold the perfumed foraka up to their nose in order to cover up that bad smell. Um, you will notice he is, is wearing a kandar. So it is fairly common for them to, to carry those. It's also common for them to carry what's called an asa, which is a stick, sort of general purpose, you know, for guiding goats or driving off dogs or telling people to leave you alone or for whatever other reason. It's very common for them to carry those. Now, the men, will, well, the dishdasha is everyday wear, but if they're wanting to dress up, they will wear a thing called a bisht, which is like a cloak that's open in the front that they wear over it, and usually it's darker. It will be black or a darker color and over the white dishdasha, and it will have embroidery on it. So that's the dressy look for men. There are two kinds of hats that you will see when you visit Salala tomorrow. One of them is what this man is wearing, which they usually wrap in the form of a turban. It's actually uh, sort, of, sort of a cotton pashmina or whatever. It's a piece of cotton cloth that they fold into a triangle, and they will wrap it around their head frequently as a turban. One of the things that's distinctive, if you ever see a turban like that, that has a piece hanging down on one side, that is unique, uniquely Omani. The Omanis almost always will do that. This man, gentleman does not have it that way, but usually they'll have one side hanging down longer. And these things are great. Just uh, the the um, This is called a um, musar, the piece of cloth that they wrap around. They can make it a turban. It's great because you can leave it out hanging. It'll keep the sun off of you. You can wrap it around your face to keep the dust out of your face. Um, there, it's cool, but it, when it's cold, you can use it as a scarf. I actually have a couple of the, the sort of uh, northern Middle Eastern version of this is a kafia. Um, I hate to bring up this image, but the person known for wearing a kafia in a mean way was uh, Yasser Arafat. They're usually those are usually uh, the Palestinian. Um, the northern Middle Eastern versions of this are usually black and white or red and white, whereas here they're usually white or an embroidered kind of lighter color. And so they will wrap them around their head. Um, the other kind of hat that they wear that you will see, which is more common everyday wear, is called a kuma. It looks like a bellman's cap. You know, it's sort of round and box, it's sort of a pillbox thing, except they're usually in lighter colors and usually have a lot of embroidery. And you, they're a great souvenir. You can buy them really cheap. I have one. I didn't bring it with me on this trip, but uh, they're very cool. I actually wore, around, wore it around the boat last time we were here, and uh, uh, people thought it was very cool. At least I, they told me they did. Uh, <laughs> the women's clothing is typically very, very bright. They like very bright, at least traditionally, very bright, eye-catching, a lot of embroidery. Historically, the different colors represented different tribal affiliations. That's not so much true anymore. Um, and, and by the way, speaking of Islamic dress for women, um, the many Islamic women, especially in the more modernized uh, Arabic countries today will wear Western style clothing, but over, when they're out in public, they will wear over it a thing called an abaya, which is the floor length black, usually cotton, sort of loose flowing kind of gown. When you see someone in an abaya in most countries, underneath that, they'll have Western clothes. But, so they'll wear their own clothes, but the abaya is a sign of, of a modest dress. And I've had people ask me, why is it that in some countries the Islamic women cover, you know, they wear burqas, which is the covering that even covers the eyes, you know, they just have sort of a, a mesh opening there. And in some countries they dress more, more contemporary, like in Turkey, which is 98% Islamic, the women will dress in very much Western style dress. But you'll notice, in, even in Turkey, when the women go outside, they often will put on an overcoat. You see a lot of overcoats on women, even in warmer weather in Turkey. And the reason for that is the Quran does not say a woman has to be completely covered up. So in Islam, there is no one rule about how a woman should dress. What the Quran says is that a woman should dress modestly. And different cultures in the, in the Islamic world interpret modesty for women differently. In some cases, it just means, you know, no short skirts and no sleeveless tops or whatever. And modesty simply means a modest Western dress. In some countries, modesty means you need to have your hair covered. And they will wear what's called a hijab. A hijab is the thing that has just an opening for the face and it's sort of a cowl hood that covers the rest of the head. That's called a hijab. So um, some places they will do that because a woman's hair is considered immodest, if you will. Um, and in, 
So it's, a, it's more a cultural difference than it is something that Islam dictates. And that's why different Islamic countries have different dress for women, because they consider modesty as having different definitions in different places. But you'll see the abayas, the black flowing kind of cloak that women wear. You will see the uh, hijab, just the head covering. And in some cases, you may see, even in a country like Oman, you may see women in burqas, which means even their, even their, their whole face is covered and they're looking through a mesh kind of thing, so you can't really even see their eyes. There's a wide variety of different dress uh, in that regard. But often you will see these very bright colors, not just on little girls, but on um, adult women as well. Not as much now as historically. That's more traditional costume. But um, I mentioned the Kandar dagger. It is considered a symbol of Oman for a man in the Omani culture. This is a symbol of where he came from. Some of the designs will vary. Sometimes they're very simple. They'll have a wooden or leather sheath. And sometimes for dress occasions, they'll have beautiful um, gold or silver kind of sheaths that they go into. Uh, they represent for an Omani man his manhood, his courage, his willingness to do what's necessary when it's necessary. That's why they carry those. I mentioned the Tao. That doesn't mean they're violent. That's not what I mean by that at all. It's a, just a, it's a symbolism for them. The Tao is the boat that it is higher in the bow, um, in the, the, the prow, and in the rear of the boat. They're very stable, and this is, again, a symbol of Oman, a long, great tradition of shipbuilding for many other countries as well. In fact, Sur, uh, one of the, the coastal cities in Oman, is considered one of the great shipbuilding cities of all time. And several of the cities, for instance, Muscat, there was a period of time in which Muscat, the capital city of mainland Oman, was the primary port in the whole Indian Ocean. It was the, the most significant trading port anywhere, not just in the Arabian Sea or the Persian Gulf area, but the entire Indian Ocean. So they have had been of great significance in terms of global impact over the years. Um, it's surprising the variety of kind of geography that you will get, everything from the sort of desert and rocky gravel mountains to areas where they, they have a lot of palm trees along the coastal areas. There are some places you would swear you were in, you know, in, in Oman that you would swear you were in the countryside in England. Um, and not a lot of that, granted, because it's mostly along the coast, and then there's sort of gravel plain, and then you reach the mountains. Some of the mountains are quite significant. And so Oman, Oman really sees themselves as promoting a lot more tourism. Uh, in the future. They're beginning to do that. I mean, the fact that we're visiting there and they're prepared, they have, when we were here, excellent guides, uh, very interesting places that they'll take us. And the they see tourism as being a significant potential for them in the future. Now, they are an oil producing country, but they are not a really rich oil country like Saudi Arabia or um, Iraq or the, the United Arab Emirates. They are listed, Oman is listed as the 25th largest oil producing country, which means they have enough oil for stable income from that, but not that, like in some countries, they have enough money that they can just give everybody a, you know, um, a monthly check based upon the oil income. That's true with some of the countries. But they, they're expecting that tourism will become more and more important to this country as they go along. There are a number of fascinating sites. I have not been here, but I'm, I'm hoping to be able to make it. This is, I mentioned the other day, traditionally the tomb of Job from the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament Job. It is outside Salala, Oman, and apparently that's him, as I said the other day. Um, I don't know, I haven't seen him. Wouldn't, wouldn't recognize him if I did. <laughs> but there's also, those of you who go on the Serene Salala tour, you will be able to visit the uh, Grand Mosque of Sultan Qaboos in Salala. It is a beautiful building. They are very anxious for people to visit it. They will walk you through it. There's no restrictions. Many mosques do not allow non-Muslims inside, but they will walk you through it. I don't even think they made us take our shoes off, did they, Carolyn? Yeah, they did. did they? Okay. Uh, but they're very, you know, we, we were free to wander around. They also have a school um, in, is, as part of that facility. They do a great job of explaining uh, what's going on in terms of uh, their faith and Islam and the Quran. So for those of some of you, if you want to, uh, tomorrow to take the Serene Salala tour, you should get, if it's consistent with what we had, a basic introduction. And later on, we'll talk a lot more about uh, Islam and what it's all about. Now, the most important part of their history, at least from our perspective, happened in 1970 and following. This is Saeed bin Tamur. He was 
the Sultan of Muscat and Oman, remember that's what they call the country, Muscat and Oman was the name, prior to 1970. He ruled from 1932 to 1970. He has been called the last feudal monarch of Arabia. And he was known for several sayings, which I don't think anybody would want to be known for. For instance, he said, keep the dogs hungry and they will follow you. He was once told that he was not giving his people what they needed, and he said, I'm the one who decides what they need. He was an absolute monarch. As I say, he maintained slaves from the mid-1800s um, to the mid-1900s. The country had gone backwards in terms of any kind of... Per the people were in a horrible state, and I'll give you some examples of that. Up until 1970, the economy produced annually, the GDP, was $100 million. Now, that wouldn't be one of the smallest states in the United States today, for instance. This was nothing, and that was all oil money, because they really had not maximized the oil potential. So they had $100 million for the whole country. In the whole country of Oman, there were three primary schools. There were no secondary schools. There were only 1,000 people in school. Any student that wanted to get an education beyond one of those three primary schools, if they lived close enough to that, if they wanted to get an education, they had to illegally sneak out of the country knowing that they would not be let back in, wow. that they were going into exile. That's the only way anybody could be educated. Now, a lot of people did it, which means after um, this sultan went out of power, there were a lot of educated Omanis elsewhere in the world who were anxious to come back. Mm -hmm. And it ended up being a great resource after uh, Timur was out of power. They were perpetually having insurrection. The Dofour region was in rebellion against the rest of the country. The, there was a communist uh, uprising that was being supported by communist nations. Um, every, the Imam, there was a multi, starting from the 1950s, the Imam had challenged the authority of the Sultan and they were fighting each other, literally with armies fighting each other. The Imam got chased out of the country. The Sultan was supported by Great Britain and Iran, the Shah of Iran at that point. And uh, the Imam, when he ran, he fled to Saudi Arabia. He was supported by Saudi Arabia and Egypt. This was an international back and forth between these guys. There was constant insurrection. Um, they had the world's highest infant mortality rate. That's what IMR means. The high, the more babies died here than anywhere else in the world per capita. Ninety percent of the people had malaria. That was rampant tuberculosis. There was severe malnutrition, not just that they didn't have a good diet. Severe malnutrition was almost universal. The people had nothing to eat. Um, there were no movie theaters. There were no radio stations or TV stations. It was forbidden to show movies. Um, there was no playing of musical instruments. In fact, the army had a band with musical instruments, and one day the sultan decided he didn't like that, so he had all their instruments thrown in the ocean. They had People were not allowed to wear eyeglasses. It was considered too modern. There was no traveling into the country without the personal approval of the Sultan, and why would you want to go? <laughs> you couldn't leave the country, and you could not go from one place to another. Nobody could visit uh, Dofar. People, remember I told you the coastal people and the inland that they were fighting? People who lived inland could not travel to the coast. People from the coast could not travel inland. People who lived in one valley could not go to the next valley. They were prevented from doing so. Um, it was forbidden to build a new house. It was forbidden to repair an old house. You could not install a lavatory or a gas stove. It was illegal. You could not cultivate any new land. You could not buy a car without the Sultan's personal permission. And on and on and on. It was a horrendous place. Well, for all of that, and all of the rebellion, and all of the awfulness, all of this was a result of the sultan's insecurity. He was afraid that he would lose power if the people were educated, if they were cared for, if you know he wasn't going to pamper them, and it ended up being one of the worst places in the world to be. Well, in the 1960s, the whole province of Dofar, which is where we're going to be, Salala, it's almost half the country now, rose up in rebellion, and so there was a war going on there, and in 1966, there were, um, well, there were two attempts, the worst one in 1966, attempts by Dofari rebels to assassinate the Sultan. 
So from 1966 on, he went into his palace in Salala, where we're going to be, they'll drive you by the palace, and wouldn't come out. Most of the people of Oman had never seen a sultan, because they didn't travel. So he locks himself in, in, uh, in the palace, doesn't come out because he's scared, he's afraid somebody's going to kill him. He had had a son, Kavus, who was born in 1940. Kavus had been educated some in, in Oman by special tutors, then in India a little bit, and then he went to England. He ended up attending Sandhurst, which is the military academy in England, and he joined the British Army for a period of time, was assigned to Germany with the British Army, ended up coming home. When he came home, his father locked him up in the palace and would let him out. For six years, he was under house arrest oh because his father felt threatened. And in fact, even though the Sultan and his son the future sultan, lived right next to each other. They didn't see each other for the 14 months before the coup that ended up getting rid of the old sultan because his father completely ignored him even though he wouldn't let him go anywhere. He could have all the books he wanted and all the records he wanted, but he couldn't leave. This is the current sultan. He is Kabus bin Said al-Said, the sultan of Oman, and he became sultan in August of 1970. He still is the sultan today. He is the longest ruling Middle Eastern um, uh, head of state. He is an absolute ruler. He is, um, he has complete authority over everything, but, while that doesn't sound good to our Western ears, when he took over, after being a pr virtually a prisoner for six years, there was a coup in the palace, a group of other um, uh, Omanis supported him to become the new sultan, there was, uh, there was a little bit of blood, but mostly because they say that, that there was some blood shed, nobody died, but they said that all the blood that was shed was because the old sultan was going nuts, you know, <laughs> trying to cut people. He ended up, was not, was not harmed, he was sent off into exile into Britain and lived there for a number of years in a very nice hotel suite, uh, and then <laughs> passed away. Later on, his body was repatriated back to Oman, and he is buried in the royal cemetery, but he was dethroned by force in 1970. When his son, Kabus, took over, and um, the, the coup was actually on the 23rd of July, 1970, he became officially in power in uh, August. The first thing he did was he moved to Muscat. He moved to a different location. And he immediately declared that it is no longer Muscat and Oman. This is now the Sultanate of Oman as a symbol. We are not gonna be split in parts anymore. He immediately left and visited every region of Oman, the first time these people had ever seen their ruler, the Sultan. He comes back, he, because he had this insurrection, particularly, uh, and much of it was communist supported, he had built up the army with the help of Britain, but in order to suppress this rebellion, but at the same time he said, anyone who turns over their arms, who doesn't fight, complete amnesty. He did not want to, to fight his own people. And he said, anybody who's willing to stop this, complete amnesty, no, no conditions. But if you keep it up, then we will make sure that he, they suppress the rebellion. But the fact is that in addition to everything else, he immediately stopped all of the restrictions that his father had put on. All of the travel restrictions, you know, musical instruments. In fact, he's a huge supporter of classical music. The Omani Orchestra is considered one of the best in the world. They, they audition young people, and, if, and they, if they're good, they support them, and they educate them, and they teach them how to play the instruments better, and the, um, the Orchestra of Oman, the official Sultan's Orchestra of Oman, is considered one of the best in the world. So the idea of getting rid of all the musical instruments, no longer in place. When he got rid of all those restrictions, he then launched a very aggressive campaign to improve both health care and education in his country. Well, very shortly after that, all of the people that had been fighting against the Sultan decided they were now his friends. Mm -hmm. And he succeeded in ending all of the insurrection, in ending all of the battle between the, you know, the culture of the coastline and the culture of the interior. As he continued, he, you know, some people said when he took over and he was starting all this, they said, well, when are you going to have elections? And he said, my people don't know what a vote is. And we're not going to have a vote until we get down the road and we know that we've straightened out some of the problems because they had more problems than almost anybody. <coughs> a benign dictatorship is a very efficient form of government. And so he, to this day, has maintained authority. But 
he created a bank cameral, which means two houses of parliament. Now, the, he has ultimate control. He can veto anything they say. He has ultimate ability in the legal system as well. He can, he can give somebody a reprieve or he can have them arrested if he wants. But he created a council of ministers. He created uh, their version of a constitution, which is called the Basic Statutes of State, which declare the rights of the people. He gave the right of vote to women. In fact, he insisted, he appointed women as senior ministers in his country. And there are women representatives, a good proportion of them, in the bicameral uh, Congress, if you will. He has been able, over the last 45 years, to maintain diplomatic relations with everybody. He is considered a friend to the United States and the United Kingdom. He has also very close relations with Iran and Iraq. Astonishingly, during the Iraq War, he, uh, the Sultan of, of Oman maintained close diplomatic relations with Iraq at the same time that he sent a contingent of military to join the Allied forces that were attacking Iraq. And he managed to make that work. <laughs> he is an astonishing guy, in case you can't figure this out. Um, and even though technically the country is considered not free because he still has absolute authority, he has done so much for that country that the people love him. Now, during the Arab Spring, they had some people, you know, Arab Spring was the time in which a lot of the Arab countries, uh, there was rebellion and revolt, several, several governments were thrown out of power, etc. There were some people who were protesting because he still has absolute power. They don't elect the Sultan. And there was some suppression of that. Not violent, you know, but some people were, uh, were arrested, but they were released eventually. Nobody, as far as I know, nobody was disappeared. Uh, but there is a point at which they will, he, he will not let you go beyond. And so it is not completely free in that regard. And we have a lot of heartburn about that, but let me tell you what he's done. In 1970, the budget was $100 million. In 2013, it was $163 billion. So the economic development of uh, Sultan Gaboos has been pretty successful. In 1970, they had three primary schools, 1,000 students total in the whole country. They now have 1,000 state schools, 650,000 students. Those of you who were on the Dow Cruise yesterday, if you could understand our guide, he had quite an accent, um, we were out in the fjord, and there were small villages along this fjord that can only be accessed by either boat or helicopter. There were no roads. There is a boat that comes every day and picks up the children and takes them 20 minutes to Kassab to school and brings them back free of charge. There are electrical lines running over those rugged hills. The government has provided electricity. The government has boats that delivers clean water to all of those communities free of charge. Education is free and they say if anybody gets sick, all they have to do is radio in or call in and they will send an uh, army helicopter to pick the people up and take them into the hospital, and that's free of charge. The government has provided services to people in the most remote areas. Um, in terms of stability, there was perpetual uh, insurrection when his father was in charge. Today, they are called the 59th most peaceful country in the world. Now, if that doesn't sound so good, the United States is 107th <laughs> most peaceful. And that's based upon a lot of different criteria. Medical care, whereas they used to have the highest infant mortality rate in the world, today 99% of the people have access to medical care. It's considered by the World Health Organization as the eighth best record of medical care in the world in the last 45 years. Um, and on and on and on. They have television stations that are free, they have radio stations, movie theaters, Virtually anything that, that you would consider part of a progressive, modern, civilized world, this one man has been responsible for. Sultan Qaboos bin Saeed al Saeed. Uh, quite extraordinary. Um, there is, this is his palace in Old Muscat. He also has a palace in Salala where he lived and grew up, but most of his time now is in Muscat because he's made sure people understand that's the capital rather than be isolated. Salala is pretty far away from everything else, although it's a wonderful city. Um, this is the um, Sultan Qaboos University, a very modern, very progressive university. It's not the only university in the country, but the adult literacy rate in, is in excess of 90% now, more than 90% of adults uh, are literate compared to when there were only a thousand students in primary school in the whole country. You can imagine what the literacy rate was back then. So, um, 
quite extraordinary. I think you'll enjoy Salala. It is a, uh, we were very impressed. It is clean. It is beautiful. The guide we had was, was sort of bashful and cute and also very funny. Uh, you may not, he may tell you the same story, uh, joke tomorrow, and if, if you get the same guy and he tells you this, then laugh yeah. anyway. But we're driving along, and over on one side, there was something that clearly looked like a concrete factory. Because it's very, there's an industrial part of town, very industrial. But even like the street lights and everything are beautifully done. You know, it's very artistic. And he pointed to this factory over on the side, and he said, and that, that over there, very quiet, over there, that's our ice cream factory. No, no, wait, no, that's concrete. They make concrete over there. Okay. <laughs> Um, we were very impressed with Salala and with this country. Any questions about any of that? Yes? What's the, is there a transition plan for, obviously, the Sultan's 70, 70 years old at this point? Correct. Um, he was married at one point. He's divorced. He does not have any children. One of the things that he wrote into these basic statutes of state, which are the, what amounts to their constitution, it guarantees the freedom. One of the things he did that was very much needed and important was he wrote into that a uh, plan of succession and what it will be is if he does not name a successor before his death and he's reluctant to do so and that's not unusual because you name a successor and all of a sudden people start fighting over it if you haven't named a successor they're not going to fight yet when he dies he is to leave behind a sealed envelope with, with the government ministers that says this is my appointed successor if he fails to do so for some reason he dies suddenly and hasn't written it down yet then the family has a certain number of days, that is the royal family, his family, to come up with one recommended successor. If the family, royal family, doesn't come up with one successor, if they're arguing amongst themselves, then the ministers of government have the right to decide who's going to be the ruler. So they do have a very specific plan that is outlined in the basic statutes of state. Um, and, but that's been a real question. And again, even though he's an absolute ruler and, you know, dictator is not an inappropriate word, he can do whatever he wants in that country. And yet whatever he wants seems to be in the best interest of the people. They really love him. Uh, last year, there was a period of eight months where because of health concerns, he went to Germany and he was being treated for health concerns, which they didn't talk a lot about. They didn't say what it was. And people began to be very concerned that they hadn't seen him, heard from him. You know, was he still there? And, you know, they were worried because they really loved this guy. The national holiday is his birthday. All right. And the national anthem is a song that was written to honor him. So he very much is the focus of things. Well, he, made, he came back from Germany. He's made public appearances. And the government was very, you know, our guides in Oman uh, made it clear to us, we are so relieved that Sultan Qaboos is okay, because we were really worried about it. Now, this is a man who's an absolute dictator, and yet, uh, with a few exceptions, not everybody loves the fact that you've got a, a, a Sultan that can do whatever he wants, but most of the country seems to really love him. Um, Who ran the country while he was gone for eight months? Well, there, is a, there's a, there are government ministers. Uh, I don't know if there was somebody else that was appointed you know, in his position, but there are government ministers. There are, it is a bicameral, a two-party, uh, a two-house, uh, government now they they pass regulations uh, and laws and things like that but those laws are always subject to his final approval but he seems to be quite generous in that regard too population. Uh, the population is uh, 3.7 million I think it is 3.8 of which almost half of them are not Omanis they are from outside you know who have come in as workers etc that's very common in the Persian Gulf countries in fact in Dubai 60% of the population of the United Arab Emirates apparently are from Southeast Asia. They are Filipino or uh, Indian or, or something else, and they come in as workers. Um, so that, that sort of proportion is quite common in this part of the world, where a lot of people have come in for the oil industry and various, uh, various other things. Yes? How does the 163 million break down as far as the income is concerned compared the to the how does the 163 billion break down? It is still heavily um, from oil. You know, they've continued to develop. That's one of the things his father had not appropriately developed even the oil industry. And all of the 100 million prior to 1970 was all from oil. They didn't have anything else. They have some agricultural exports. Um, tourism is growing, as I said. They um, are industrial in some ways. I just mentioned that they, you know, they have uh, industrial complexes. They make concrete things of that sort. Many of those things are exported as well. So they really have worked. Caboose has encouraged them to work toward having a much more balanced economy, so that it's not all just oil. 
because obviously the problem is the price of oil drops, you know, $30 a barrel or whatever, and you've got a problem all of a sudden. And they have not suffered quite that, you know, even when oil has gone down, they haven't suffered quite that much damage. So they've got a much more balanced economy. Um, yes? Would you point out to us where Muscat is? Uh, yes. Um, this is Muscat right here, all right? Um, and I would mention this is Nizwa. This, this is where the Imam was. So from this area, the coastal area, that was for prior to Kabus, that was the Sultan's control and it, and the cities down here, Salala is all the way down here in the corner, all right? But Nizwa here is where the Imam lived and he controlled all that interior area. And so there was always this conflict between the Sultan and the coastal, more cosmopolitan, if you call it that, kind of thinking versus the very tribal, traditional, conservative Islamic uh, control from the interior, all right? So, and the, the major cities uh, would be Muscat, Salala down here, and then there are various other cities along here. Sur is where they were famous for making uh, the ships, uh, etc. Okay, other questions? There, there are oil region, what, what part of uh, Oman is there oil exploration region? I don't actually know the answer to that. Where is the oil? You know, where is the oil occurring? Where are they, like, the field? yeah, the, the, I, I don't know. Uh, I'll always confess if I don't know something. I mean, if I can make something up, I will. But if I don't know the answer, I can't think of anything real quick, I'll tell you. Interior, well, you know, typically it is. Now, the thing is, as you'll see in Salala, along the coast, in fact, you can, there are some maps which will show you a green belt where they actually grow things. And then they have sort of gravel plains, and then there is a ridge line of mountains along here before you get up to the what's called the empty quarter of Saudi Arabia. Where the empty quarter is exactly that. There's nothing there but sand, really. Um, and so I'm not sure exactly where their primary oil fields are. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have the answer to that. Any other questions? I think you will enjoy Salala. I certainly hope so. If I could be, uh, yes, was question? Uh, when you visit the Grand Mosque, right? Well, appropriate attire anytime you're in an Islamic country, and this is true pretty much anywhere on this trip. Um, it is considered anything above the knee for men or women is considered inappropriate. Um, sleeveless for women is not considered appropriate. So the generally accepted thing is to wear shorts longer than what I'm wearing, if you're going to wear shorts. Um, and for women, more conservative, all right? Like, but a, a skirt that falls below the knees is considered fine. It's a good idea to wear something that's, you know, at least short sleeves, that's, you're not showing your shoulders, etc. And if you're going to be visiting a mosque, and most mosques, if they allow you to visit, they'll help you with this, they'll provide something for you, is for women to carry a scarf, because they do expect you to cover your head when you go in. So, more modest dress, nothing sleeveless, nothing above the knees, and carry a scarf if you're a woman. For men, it's not as strict a requirement, but it's still considered polite probably to wear long pants if you know you're going to be visiting a, a mosque. When I travel in this part of the world, I have two or three pairs of, of sort of geeky pants that are the zip off. You know, you can zip the, the legs off. And I know that that's really dweeby. But <laughs> I, the reason I have those is because if I get really hot and I'm out and I'm not around a mosque, I can take the pant legs off and I'm getting ready to go in some place where I need to be more respectful, more modest, I can put them back on again. Okay, And so that's, that's the only reason I would own those kinds of things. Um, and, and you, oh, Here first, uh, just a second. Yes. How did the first sultan come about? The first sultan came about, he was actually the imam. And he was responsible, the, the Portuguese had been driven out a little bit before that, but in the mid-1700s, he was responsible for getting the Omanis together and driving off the Iranians, who had controlled part of the coastline. And by driving off the Iranians, and therefore freeing the country from outside influence, he uh, became not only the imam, but they made him sultan. And they said, you're not only in charge of our religious stuff, but we want you to be the head of the country as well. Now, whether it's because he demanded it or whether somebody nominated him, I don't know. But in 17, the 1740s, the first, um, imam, the first sultan who had been an imam was Saeed. He was uh, Ahmed al-Saeed bin Saeed. And so that Said, this new sultan, is Qaboos bin Said al Said. It's all part of the Said dynasty. It's existed since the mid 1700s. And it was because he was successful in freeing them from the Iranian oppressors. Back there, yes? Well, it sounds like there's not a military. There is a military. Yeah, in fact. Well, they have a military. Um, in fact, 
when he, when Tabus took over, the military was really weak. They had like um, 5,000 soldiers and virtually no equipment because it was not modernized. But with the help of Britain especially, they immediately increased the size of the army. They had uh, various military support, actually troop support, from Britain and from particularly the Shah of Iran assisted them. And they were, he worked immediately with help to build up the military in terms of military equipment, trucks, airplanes, you know, helicopters fairly early on. And so they built up the military, and they do have a military presence now. They are capable of defending themselves. Plus, they don't have to worry too much about that, because you remember what I said is that Oman is successful in being on good relations with everybody. They still are close um, allies to Iran, Iraq, as well as the United States and the United Kingdom. So nobody is threatening them, and if anybody ever did, they've got people on both sides of the aisle, so to speak, who would come to their support and defense. Um, everybody seems to love Sultan Qaboos and the country of Oman. Nobody considers them an enemy. They're not on anybody's bad list. And so if somebody like you know, ISIL or ISIS, I prefer ISIL, I think that's a better translation of Daesh, um, if ISIL were to decide they wanted to come over from Yemen or whatever and cause problems, every other country in the region would come to their support. And I think everybody knows that, and so nobody messes with them. You know, they're the nice guy in the block, and nobody wants to mess with them. And you said he was... Now, speaking he, of Yemen, with the current situation in Yemen, are they having any problem with the people flooding across the borders? And, and I'm not aware of any difficulty with people coming across the border. They had, again, back in the, under the old Sultan, one of the difficulties they had is there was a lot of influence from Yemen supporting the insurrection in Dofar, because Dofar is, right, is, the, is the part of Oman that's right next to uh, Yemen. See, this... This is Yemen down here. This is the Dofar region, okay? Um, so they had difficulty back then. I am not aware of any serious problems that they've, they've had, with, especially with regard to the latest problems in Yemen. Now, I don't doubt anytime you've got conflict, there are going to be refugees that flee to the countries next door. But I, I have not read of or heard of any problems in that regard. But that doesn't mean there aren't any. I'm just not aware of them. Anyone else? Thank you very much. This afternoon, we will talk about uh, unity and diversity in the Middle East. And enjoy Salah.